What's up and welcome back to Budget Wargamer. We've got some leaks that have been out for the Necron Codex and some information that's officially been put out regarding the Necron army from Games Workshop themselves. So let's take a quick peek and hiding in one of the Forge Bane um, articles that they've got on warhammer-community.com at the very bottom they've got a listing of the, dyna the dynastic codes for the Necrons. And these are gonna be like your regimental bonuses, things like that. So let's take a quick look at those. Let's not dive too much into them because we've got a lot to cover. And I did want to touch on the Necrons because uh, as much as I've collected of Necrons over the years, I've never actually played my armies. I've just only ever built them up and just kind of enjoyed the models. Um, not so much putting together the Necron Warriors because I found those to be one of the most frustrating Warhammer 40K armies to put together with all their little nimble fingers snipping them out of the sprue breaking arms and legs and just they don't fit on 25 millimeter bases they should all be on 32 mils so i digress let's go we've got the mefrit which have solar fury as their dynastic code and it says each time a model with this code shoots an enemy unit that is within half range of its weapon's maximum range the armor penetration characteristic of that weapon is improved by one so this even affects weapons that have no armor penetration. So if you have an armor penetration of zero, you now have a negative one. If you've got a weapon with a massive armor penetration, it will even add an additional one to that as well. So this isn't too bad, although you'll have to find out what the range of most of the Necron weapons are, but that's better than nothing, absolutely helping you take out some of your enemies. So you've got the Assault Tech, they have Relentless Advance. It says a unit with this code advances. Um, if a unit with this code advances, it treats all ranged weapons it is equipped with as assault weapons until the end of the turn, meaning that you can advance and still shoot with those weapons. In addition, unless it has advanced this turn, a unit with this code does not suffer the penalty to, to hit rolls for moving and firing a heavy weapon. So you can do your regular movements and still fire heavy weapons without any negative modifiers to your to hit. So this is actually a pretty good one. So let's go take a look at Nefrek. This is translocation beams, and if a unit with this code advances, you just add six inches to its move characteristic for that movement phase instead of rolling dice, that's great. If it's being affected by thy will be done or wave of command, you just add seven, since that was one of the um, character abilities or warlord abilities to be able to add one to the advance rolls, so you don't lose that bonus if you decide to um, command these units. In addition, if a unit with this code advances, its models can move across models in terrain as if they were not there. This is big because this means that if you move six or seven inches during your advance, that even though your normal movement is still subject to regular movement penalties, you can now advance from behind your own units, advance across your enemy's units, um, potentially to help you hit those more desirable targets and get past their screening units. So, this is a potential way to help you kind of hop, skip, and a jump through those guys. So some, that's not to be overlooked. I think that's actually a pretty strong one, even though most people tend to focus on the bonuses that tend to affect hitting and wounding or saving. So this one here is the Nicolac, Ni Nihilac is, how, I guess, how I'd pronounce it. It's aggressively territorial. You reroll hit rolls of one for units with this code, whether they shoot, which includes Overwatch, so that's a good buff since you're only usually hitting on sixes, as long as they did not move in the preceding movement phase and they have not disembarked from a transport during this turn. So maybe great, maybe not so great, especially considering that Necron Warriors and many of the units in the army don't have extremely long range. You're not going to be sitting back trying to outgun Cadians with this type of special ability, but it is somewhat similar to the Cadian um, regimental uh, benefit. So... Let's take a look at the very last one that they've leaked. Uh, I'm not, not sure if there's only going to be five in the codex, but this is at least the five that they've teased us with in this article. And you've got the Novok, which is Awakened by Murder. You can reroll failed hit rolls in the fight phase for units with this code if they have charged, were charged, or perform, performed a heroic intervention. So basically, if it's not the second uh, turn of combat for that unit, they're going to be able to reroll failed hit rolls in the fight phase. That's not a bad one either, especially if you're the type to get up close and personal, which seems to be inevitable in Warhammer 40,000, since everything is move, shoot, fight in that mentality. Now let's take a look at some of the unofficially leaked information, and I've got this here from Natfka. You can find them at natfka.blogspot.com, and let's cycle through some of the teasers and some of the leaks that they've got. Now keep in mind that these are not officially confirmed, so these may or may not actually be the real deal. It's possible that these could be faked as a type of fan fiction, but 
For 10 points, we've got Emotech the Stormlord, one of the named characters in the Necron army, and he's got a beefy stat line for sure. Um, he comes with the Gauntlet of Fire, which is essentially a D6 Flamer, so nothing fancy there. But it does make him a unit that you wouldn't want to necessarily charge against, since he'd be able to stand on Overwatch and hit you with his Gauntlet of Fire. As well as Staff of the Destroyer, which has an 18-inch range, Assault 3, Strength 6, AP-3, 2 damage. So that's great for taking out light vehicles. If you feel really frisky, you could try to take out a heavy vehicle, and it's certainly going to put in a lot of work and cause some damage to marine equivalents and even terminator equivalents out there in the shooting phase. Now, in the hand-to-hand -hand combat phase, the fight phase, you're, you're still going to have a strength of six because of his base strength. You're going to have that AP minus three and D2 with three attacks, so it's basically the same in the fight phase as it is in the shooting phase with the same two plus to hit either way around. Now his special rules, we'll get through them real quick. He can use Thy Will Be Done twice during his phase if you he, if he choose a, a friendly Saltec infantry. So that must be one of his keywords. So if you're looking to put together a Saltec dynasty, this would be your character there, or at least one of them. He's a Lord of Storm, so he's got that once per battle in your shooting phase. You can call a storm, pick an enemy unit within 48 inches, and the character rolls a D of the of him and, and roll a D6. On a 2 plus, that unit suffers that many mortal wounds. So if you rolled a 6, you'd cause 6. If you rolled 2, you'd cause 2. And anywhere in between, just don't roll a 1. Then roll a D6 for each enemy unit within 6 inches of that unit. And on a 6, the unit being rolled uh, suffers D3 mortal wounds. So it does have a little bit of like a lightning, chain lightning effect. He's undying, so... He regains D3 lost wounds at the beginning of your turn, which makes him pretty hard to take down considering he already has six wounds, toughness five, two plus save, and phase shifter gives him a four plus of vulnerable save. So he's also got a buff here to Saltac Flayed Ones, and he's also a grand strategist if you're bringing a Battle Forge list, which I think is more common these days. Looking at the Transcendent Satan, this is like the one that comes inside of the Tesseract Vault. You've got a very strong Strength 7, Toughness 7, 8 wound uh, unit with a 4 plus armor save. I would bet this has a 4 plus and vulnerable save. So it's got Reality Unravels. If this model is ever reduced to 0 wounds, roll a d6 before removing it from the battlefield. And on a 4 plus, tears a hole in Reality. And each enemy unit within 3 inches suffers d3. And each unit, not just enemy unit, suffers d3 mortal wounds. So... Don't try to take him down in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but you can you can bet by looking at his crackling tendrils, this guy's only going to try to fight you face-to-face -face with his AP minus 4 causing D6. And at strength 7, toughness 7, this guy's going to be able to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat and take on anything from Lehman Russes down to Grotz. Um, although with only 4 attacks, he's not going to be able to easily take on Horde armies. But I think the Necrons sort of always have a challenge with Horde armies. Anything that causes them to roll a lot of saving throws and gives them way too many targets to take on. So he's got some other special rules you guys should check out there as well. Now here's the Void Reaper. It says models with War Scythe, War Scythe or Void Scythe only. The Void Reaper replaces the Bear's War Scythe. So this is a special piece of equipment. This is potentially a relic. Um, that would be there for the army. I don't have the clarifying the clarification on this one, but in melee, it's got strength of seven against vehicles, but on anything else, it wounds automatically on a two plus. So this is insane because this means you could go up against something like a hive tyrant, a carnifex, or an, um, anything else of a like an Eldar avatar. Go up against another Necron army and fight their Shard of Satan in hand-to-hand -hand combat and still wounded on a 2+, plus, regardless of its toughness. And then if you're attacking vehicles, it just reverts to a strength of 7. So at an AP minus 4 and D uh, and 3 damage, this thing is going to put down some big big wound creatures. I, I like that special ability, and I do certainly anticipate that that would be a relic. So here's another of the stratagems. We've got Emergency Invasion Beam, and this would be when one of your Night Scythe or Monolith the very last one in your army is destroyed. You can beam in a unit of friendly uh, unit that's still in their tomb world and put them within three inches of the Night Scythe or Monolith as long as they're at least one inch away from enemy models. That helps you make sure that basically your deep striking units, you get at least that last one in on the tabletop. So let's go back. We got Dimensional Corridor. You use this stratum at the start of your movement phase. You select one of your infantry units from the army that is more than one inch away from enemy, so it can't be in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you're gonna remove it from the battlefield and set it again so that it is wholly within three inches of a monolith from your army and at least one inch away from enemy models. 
So it counts as having disembarked. And what this is great for is if you've got a unit that is sitting out in the open and is quite vulnerable to your enemy and about to potentially get charged, you say, ah, 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 and you take that unit back and you put it somewhere within three inches of your monolith. That's not too bad. Uh, of course, your monolith can't be completely wrapped up in hand-to-hand -hand combat or else you won't be able to be at least one inch away. Solar Pulse, this is a one command point stratagem. And you use it after a Necron unit has declared its targets, but before you've uh, rolled the dice. You're going to pick one of the enemy units that your unit is targeting. And since that could normally be more than one unit, in this case only one of the units takes this effect, that enemy unit does not receive the benefit of cover against your unit's weapons this phase. And it's a one, point command, one command point stratagem. It'll have its utility. It won't be useful in every turn or every game, but... It's at least there and will help you out when you've got an enemy that's really just entrenching itself into cover. So, and that does, that can get annoying from time to time. So, I just thought of something here that could help you take out Emotech the Stormlord. Now, if you're a if you're a Cadian player and you've got Knight Commander Pask and he's got the Punisher Cannon and some heavy bolters, I think you would be able to tap him out and just by rolling 43 plus hits on twos, re-rolling ones. If you didn't move, you might be able to bring the Stormlord down. So we don't know the points to do a fair comparison on Stormlord, but that's certainly a viable tactic. Now, Tesseract Vault, this thing is a beast. It's got 28 wounds, so think of this thing as being kind of like a Bane Blade or Stormlord. It's got a Strength of 8, Toughness 7, and it's just massive. So you can check out those rules more. I don't see a lot of these being played, but maybe given that it's like one of these super big units, maybe more people will play it but um, that's to be seen. So let's take a look at the regular old monolith. You used to see a ton of monoliths in the game back in like third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition. I think you've seen a lot less of these lately. Part of it's because the army has branched out more from being just destroyers, Necron warriors, scarabs, and monoliths in terms of the models available. And now we've got things like knight sites, uh, tomb blades, uh, Triarch Stalkers and all the different Doom Arcs, War Barges, and stuff like that. So there's certainly a lot more vehicle options available in the Necron army. But here we've got the ability to have 20 wounds at a Toughness 8 with a 3 plus save. As always, the Monolith is going to be a hard model to bring down. It's also going to have the Living Metal rules, and then it's got some other special rules there. This is going to be one of your go-to, uh, basically, it's going to become a bullet sponge <coughs> to help ensure that your Necron warriors get across the battlefield and or have time to engage their targets of, of desire. Now, it doesn't mean that your enemy is going to necessarily focus fire on your monolith, but if they don't, you're going to have a lot of weapons of which you can fire back since there's four of the Gauze Flux arcs, and it doesn't designate that you have to fire them within a certain um, angle of fire, so you're going to basically have... 12 heavy shots at 24 inch range, strength 5, AP minus 2, and 1 damage. And then you've got one particle whip that can crack out and do heavy 6, strength 8 minus 2, D3 damage. So it could even take on some nice, strong characters or even vehicles. And of course, split fire between those since it's got the ability to do that. So that is just nuts. Tomb Blades, I don't see a lot of these on the tabletop either, but they are one of the cooler units. Kind of like a mono wheel that flies uh, 14 inch movement it's going to be one of the fastest things in your necron army save for maybe the doom scythe or night scythe three plus three plus with a toughness of five and two wounds i'm starting to like these guys already but they've got a nice assortment of weapons that gauze blaster with rapid fire one ap2 is going to be a nice strong um nice strong offense against some of those heavy armored units like marines and things like that and it'd be nice to see if that's also the same stat line carried over to the necron immortals and i, I bet you it will be and that would be uh crazy especially if you consider that you could take that um if you could take that dynasty that gives you the ability to add an additional minus one to your armor penetration when you're within half range that would give you within 12 inches ap minus three making this quite nasty so We've got a couple more things out here, and this is the powers of the Satan. So if you've got a Satan shard, these are going to be kind of like their um, warlord traits. So we've got one, two, three is all the way down here, oddly, and then four, five, six. 
So if you're looking to go through those, these are essentially, you roll them to be able to figure out what the, what the Satan powers are, the power of the Satan is for the Satan shards. So if you guys are excited about the Necrons and their release, uh, I believe that they're going to go up for pre-order next weekend with Games Workshop, or this coming weekend, because we've also got the Forge Bane box coming up for pre-order this weekend, and we've also got the Tau Codex, of which we've skipped on the opportunity to be able to talk about all the news, because it's quite plentiful. And I think that there's already been a lot of videos out there from other people talking about it. I kind of missed that boat. But I am still excited about Tau. Maybe I'll finally get some of those Ghost Kill Battle Suits because I never picked those up back in 6th and 7th edition. So this is another video from Budget Wargamer. You guys stay tuned.